We're high on a snowy mountain in Pakistan, where a group of Nepalese climbers are struggling through harsh winds. It's two o'clock in the evening. I think this is one of the hardest climb we have ever made. That's Mingma Gyalja Sherpa. He goes by Mingma G for short. He and his team are trying to make history on the world's second highest mountain, the legendary K2. The team had been navigating a route to the summit, but were blocked by a dangerous crevasse. That's a deep crack in the snow that could swallow the climbers. So they had to retreat back to their camp, a tiny cluster of tents clinging to the side of the mountain. It was so difficult to find a way through the crevasse. We were, were so high on the other side and we could not cross the crevasse when we went back and we came more on the ridge towards the Sejan sites and finally we crossed the crevasse there and 3 o'clock we made it in Camp 3. K2 is shorter than Mount Everest by about two football fields, but it's far more difficult to climb, reserved for only the most seasoned mountaineers. In the 1950s, George Bell, one of the first climbers to attempt it, called it a savage mountain that tries to kill you. Even in the summer, it's so cold that severe frostbite is a constant worry. So windy that climbers can be hurled off its face. So steep that a poorly placed ice axe or mistied rope can instantly lead to tragedy. And Mingma Ji and his fellow Nepalese, they're attempting to do something that many thought was impossible, even suicidal. They're trying to climb K2 in winter. I'm Peter Gwynn, editor-at-large at National Geographic magazine, and this is Overheard, a show where we eavesdrop on the wild conversations we have here at Nat Geo and follow them to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. In the mountaineering world, the first winter ascent of K2 was considered the last unclaimed crown jewel. And for years, I'd hear from climbers about teams planning K2 winter expeditions. But in the same breath, I'd hear that there's no way they'd actually pull it off. This week, a Nepalese climber tells us how he and his team sought to make mountaineering history. More after the break. Winter mountaineering is actually a fairly simple concept. It's, it's just mountaineering in the coldest season of the year. What gets a, a little harder to understand is why anybody would want to do it. That's Bernadette McDonald. She's a Canadian writer who covers mountaineering. Climbing mountains is hard enough, but doing it in winter, it's torture. It's brutally cold, it's very lonely, and it's windy. I, I think what most of the climbers complained about more than anything, more even than the temperatures, was the wind. And then there's the death zone. The region above 8,000 meters, which is slightly higher than 26,000 feet, where the air gets so thin that humans can't survive for long without bottled oxygen. It's kind of an inhuman kind of uh, situation. People have been climbing mountains for sport for centuries, but climbing them in winter is a relatively new thing. I think what, in a way, what we're talking about is winter climbing in the high mountains, in the Himalaya, in the Karakoram. And that definitely has kind of a start date, a start person. It began in an unlikely place, Poland, in the 1970s. What happened in Poland was that they missed out on all the big firsts because they were they were in post-World War II situation, which didn't allow them to travel. They had no money. They were basically locked down. <laughs> Sound familiar? The crown jewels of big mountain climbing are the 14 peaks on the planet that top 8,000 meters. The first climbers to summit those peaks brought international fame and glory back to their countries starting with a French team who summited Nepal's Annapurna in the summer of 1950. Three years later, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay famously climbed Mount Everest. And by 1964, all 14 had been climbed, all the crown jewels claimed. End of story, right? But then along comes Andres Zavada, a Polish climber. He came up with this idea that the way that Polish climbers could differentiate themselves and really make a name for themselves in the history of Himalayan climbing was to go at those peaks in winter. 
And that had not been done. I mean, they started kind of with a bang. In 1980, Zavada led an expedition to climb Everest in the winter. And his team made it to the summit. And it blew people's minds. I mean, they had letters from the Pope congratulating them. Of course, the Pope was Polish. But nevertheless, they had a letter from the Pope. More Polish climbers started going to the high mountains in winter. And a whole new race, invented by the Poles, was on. Bang, one year after the other, they were sending expeditions. They were talented, they were strong, they were tough. And they had all the time in the world because they didn't have jobs. Polish climbers would eventually claim 10 first ascents of the prized 8,000ers in winter. And by 2020, all of the big mountains had been climbed in winter, except for one, the Savage Mountain. K2 rises in an extremely rugged and remote part of Pakistan, near the border with China. And it's so remote that it takes a week to hike to the mountain from the nearest village. Why do you think that was that that peak stayed unclimbed in winter, you know, where the other ones had all been, even Everest had been successfully climbed? Well, first of all, okay, it's, it's true. It's not the highest, but it's definitely the most difficult. There's just the difficulty, the steepness of the mountain. Also, it's further north than Everest, so it is colder. And it's also at the very top of the range, so it's the first mountain to get the, the, the big storms from the north. So the, the winds apparently are horrendous on K2, more so than, say, on, on Everest. Unlike Everest, K2 requires precise technical climbing, especially near the top, even in the best conditions. For roughly every four climbers who make it to the top of K2 and back down, Another one dies in the attempt, and no team has made it even close to the top in winter. How big a prize was this, was K2 in winter? I think that K2 in winter was the biggest prize that was still out there. There was so much interest in who would climb it and how they would do it. And there were so many top level Himalayan climbers who were trying it or who were thinking of trying it. So I, I, I can't think of another prize that was bigger than K2 in winter. Mingma Ji was among the climbers who wanted to claim that prize. He grew up in Nepal's Rolling Valley, located west of Mount Everest. Oh, we don't have electricity, we don't have telephone lines, we don't have any road facility. So we, we actually, we have not, we had nothing. Few crops can grow so high up in the mountains and getting food from other parts of Nepal up to where they lived was expensive. We live our life under a candlelight, mm, like work, every day working on a field, We're just growing potatoes. We grew up in a very difficult life. We were the, one of the most poorest people in, in Nepal. But Rolling is famous for one thing in particular, producing world-class mountain guides. Although super dangerous, it's a job that offers one of the few ways for many Sherpa in remote areas to earn a decent living. And several of Mingma Ji's family went to work for outfitters, helping clients from around the world climb Nepal's biggest mountains. Did your father and uncles tell you stories about famous Sherpa climbers when you were growing up? Yeah, a lot. Mingma Ji would hear his father and uncles talk about expeditions to several of the 8,000ers, including Lhotse and Dalagiri, where his father had climbed with the legendary Italian climber Reinhold Messner. His first cousin, Lobsang Jangbu Sherpa, had assisted climbers during the 1996 disaster made famous by the book Into Thin Air. So in 2006, when Mingma Ji was 19, he convinced his uncle to take him on a climb to the 8,000-meter Manasalu. It was one of the most beautiful moment of my life. After that, after that, I, it, it was like kind of more interest in climbing than I joined another expedition, than another, than another. The experience convinced Mingma Ji to become a god, just like his father and uncles. But his mother was not happy with this decision. My mother, my father, they never wanted me to become a mountaineer. Years earlier, Mingma Ji's father had taken a Japanese climber up Mount Everest. And at one point, his dad took off his gloves to tie the climber's boot laces, and his hands were severely frostbitten. So my father lost eight fingers in that expedition. He lost eight fingers. 
Yeah. So oh out gosh. of 10, he, he, he lost eight. Despite what would seem to be a career-ending injury, his father continued working as a climbing guide. He continued working with, the, with his, like, very short, short fingers. And yet, his father's experience didn't stop Mingmaji from climbing. He loved being in the mountains and was especially proud of the Sherpa reputation as being among the world's strongest climbers. I can say, like, we are regarded as the king on, on 8,000. Maybe I should not say this, but... Uh... <laughs> no, you said it, man. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> because people, people all, all from all over the world, they hire Shinebli Sherpa for climbing 8,000 meter peak, right? Of course. So Mingma Ji worked for other expeditions, and eventually he built his own successful guiding business. But there was one thing that still bothered him. Even though Nepalis had been part of teams that had claimed some of the crown jewel ascents, they never accomplished one all on their own. If we see on Wikipedia or on, on internet, like if we see the winter list, there's no any Nebulous Sherpa name or no any Nebulous flag. Sherpas have always been the backbone of mountaineering in the Himalayas. They haul gear and supplies, help run the base camps, and if they stick with it, over time, they learn to guide foreign clients to the summits. Like many of his fellow guides, Mingmaji felt that Nepali climbers didn't get the same respect as some of the celebrated foreign climbers. He realized that the way to change this was by claiming the last major and arguably the greatest achievement in the big mountains, summiting K2 in winter. But he also knew it meant taking a huge risk. And it was always said that we could lose, lose the hands. We could right. lose the fingers. Yeah. Well, and especially after your father, that had happened to him. I would imagine that was really a scary thing. If it happens to me, then uh, I think my mother would, would feel more difficult than me and myself. Mingmaji knew what he was getting into. He climbed K2 before. In fact, Mingmaji is one of the only mountaineers who can claim to have climbed to the top of K2 three times. No one summited it more than that. But on those expeditions, he'd had the responsibility of leading clients. And I said, like, okay, now I'll go, I'll go back to back on K2, but I'll not lead any clients. I'll just go for myself and I go for my nations. But there were several huge obstacles before he even set foot on the mountain. First, because of COVID, his guiding business had been slow. And especially bad for a mountaineer about to tackle the climb of his life, he was out of shape. I started working on my body because I, I need to I need to be like a little little more slim and more like um, more energetic. I started uh, cycling, running. Then he had to raise money. Expeditions like K2 run into the tens of thousands of dollars. And without paying clients, the funding was all on him. So eventually Mingmaji mortgaged a piece of land he owned. And then he had to assemble a team willing to go with him on such a risky trip, which was a huge ask of the climbers, but also of their families. Like one of my Sherpa, he said like, uh, he, cannot, he cannot go because he, does, he doesn't want to lose his, lose his body parts. Even when he found some climbers who wanted to go with him, their wives thought it was way too risky. They started arguing with me. We might lose them, they might lose their fingers, and blah, 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 lots of these things. But Mingmaji believed this expedition was important, a challenge worth the risks. So we made the women a solemn promise. If their husbands died on the expedition, their families could live with him. The wives agreed, and he and his team headed to Pakistan. Coming up, when he reaches base camp, Mingmaji forms an important alliance. And on the way to the summit, he finds himself in a life-threatening situation, one that he can't turn back from. We'll have that and more after this. When Mingmaji and his team finally got to K2 base camp in late December 2020, they found out they weren't the only ones with this idea. There were about 60 climbers from several nations, including another all-Nepali team, led by a guy named Nirmal Purja, who everyone called NIMS. In the parlance of mountaineers, NIMS is a beast, almost a superhero type figure. He'd made headlines the year before when he climbed the world's 14 tallest peaks, 
all the crown jewels on back-to-back -back expeditions in just six months and six days. Just to give you some background here, the last climber who climbed them all, he did it in seven years. It's really hard to describe how insanely difficult that feat really is. And it caught the mountaineering world completely by surprise because the guy just seemed to come out of nowhere. I'm still trying to figure Nims out, actually. What's surprising to me is that unlike many of the guys he climbs with, he didn't really grow up in the high mountains. Actually, Nims comes from Chitwan, which is the tropical low altitude part of Nepal. Think elephants and palm trees, not giant snow-covered mountains. But he'd spent six years in the Gurkhas, which is part of the British military. And then later he joined the special forces and served in Afghanistan before deciding to pursue a mountaineering career. I actually caught up with Nims by phone briefly last year when he was in Kathmandu between expeditions. And I asked him about his approach to climbing big mountains. I think the biggest thing what I have learned from, from being in, in special forces is the decision-making process. Uh -huh. And also that willingness to, uh, not to give up, you know, you need to have certain, you know, mindset. Yeah. That mindset is what we, I call in a positive mindset. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you will you not have a good day at all. Yeah. But if you think, oh, it's, it's a shit day, if you just think negative about it, you're, you're not going to progress. Mm -hmm. But if you just think in everything, you can always see positiveness. And now NIMS, this new mountaineering superstar, has arrived in Pakistan with the same plan as Ming Maji, claim the first winter ascent of K2. The two Nepalese men knew of each other. They'd been sort of respectful rifles. They were both guides trying to build up their own climbing resumes. I knew I was committed to him. He knew he was committed to me. But on a mountain like K2, where things can go horribly wrong in a hurry, Ming Maji knew that the two Nepalis needed to support each other. And if something happens to you guys, we, need, we must help you guys. If something happens to us, then you must help us. Because there will be, there will be nobody to help on the mountain besides helping each other. So the teams begin climbing the mountain, hauling bottles of oxygen, tents, sleeping bags, and coils of rope. At progressively higher elevations, they establish tiny camps, little outposts they can use to shelter and recharge during a final push to the summit. On New Year's Eve, Ming Maji and his team return down the mountain to rest and analyze the weather forecasts. When they get a strange invitation, Nims is throwing a party and he wants them to come. Wait, a party at K2 base camp? They had got lots of whiskeys. They were, they were a big team, so they had, they had brought lots of whiskeys and they, they said, okay, let's celebrate uh, New Year's Eve tonight. So you guys are there to climb a mountain. It's this big, very dangerous, scary mountain. And you guys are having a party at base camp. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think you'd have time or energy to party. <laughs> <laughs> At the party, Nims makes a bold proposition. What if the two teams joined forces and start climbing together? He argues it would be safer, but also it will increase the chances that it will be a Nepali who claims the first winter ascent of K2. And he said like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna party for a while tonight, and then tomorrow morning we're gonna start back on the mountain. I said, no, it's, it's not possible. Partying and then immediately heading up the mountain seems like a bad idea to Ming Maji. His team needs to rest before they start their climb. But he tells Nims that if he wants to leave early, he can use Ming Maji's supplies stashed on the mountain. We have auctions at 7,000 meters. We have rope at 7,000 meters. You can use our auction. You can use our rope. You can use anything you, you like from my tents, from my teams. The important thing, Ming Maji says, is that the summit is claimed for Nepal. If you made summit, that's, that summit is not only yours, that summit is mine too. That summit is, is our Nepali summit. So you made summit, we, I make summit, it's the same for Nepal. The gesture touches Nims. He had the same thing. He said like, this time the kid is not for me, but the kid is for, for the nations and for our all brothers. And right. I had the same feeling that kid is not for myself. Kid is for all Nepalese. And I think that made me bring more closer to him. Yeah, it sounded like you guys trust each other at that point. That's when you started trusting right. each other. Mm. Yeah. There's an old saying in climbing, the mountain decides. And after New Year's, K2 decides not to let anyone out of base camp. Hurricane force winds sweep in, 
forcing everyone to hunker down in their tents. We had too much wind. I think almost like 140 kilometer per hour. Wow. We didn't we didn't have good sleep like for almost like for three days because it was like hitting all the nights and all day. Big winds. For two weeks, the wind howls, and when it finally lets up, Mingma Ji and Nims lead their combined team of 10 Nepali climbers up the mountain. Working together, they make rapid progress. They take turns leading the way, setting ropes for the others to follow. And in a couple of days, they're ready to make the final push to the historic summit. As the climbers move into the death zone above 8,000 meters, most of them start using their bottled oxygen. But Mingma Ji discovers a major problem. His regulator isn't working, and he isn't getting enough oxygen. It didn't work. Then I took one from my energy, one more from my energy shipper. That even that even didn't work. Finally, he gets a third regulator to work, but he's lost valuable time, and the lack of oxygen has caused him to be vulnerable to the extreme cold. I was too cold, especially my feet, and I was feared to lose my feet. And I was I was thinking very clearly in my mother's and my family because my mother she lived all all her life seeing my father so that that if if uh, i lose my fingers if i lose anything she would be crying holy all her rest of her life as badly as he wants to make history for his country mingmanji makes a difficult decision he'll give up the climb i mean there's no mountain worth losing your life for he takes out his radio to call his teammates and tell them to go on without him. And and as I, I turn on the radio and try, I try to call my Sherpa. But the radio is off and Ming Manji can't reach them. And he can't turn back without them knowing where he is because he knows they'll go look for him. So he has to keep going. His body gets colder and colder and he tries everything to keep his blood moving. I spend almost like, a, like an hour just hitting my body. So you were hitting your body like you were like hitting, like clapping your hands and hitting your legs. Right, uh, right, 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 right. I, I tried to yeah. hit lots of, lots, lots of ices on the way with, with, the, with my feet just to make myself warm. But nothing works. Mingma Ji is afraid he's about to lose his feet or worse. And then a miracle. The sun comes up. I sat on my back and it's been almost like an hour just having, having sun rays on my body just to make myself warm. Mm. When the sun started coming up, that really saved you, I guess. Right, right. Mm. One by one, the Nepalis gather just below the last slope that leads to the top. At this point, Mingma Ji and Nims, as the team leaders, could claim the right to be the first ones on the summit. I paid for my team, so I, I could go summit earlier than they do. I, I, I could go summit like uh, like 10, 10, 20 steps earlier than other other members. Nims could do that because he was spending all the money for his team. But the two leaders don't want to do that to their teams. In mountaineering, history remembers those who reached the summit first. So Nims brought this idea. So okay, we're gonna we got we we're gonna stop almost like 10 to 15 meters ahead the summit, and we're gonna make make a row and we, we're going to march, march the summit together. So that means like nobody's second in the team. Everyone is first. So even though there were 10 of you, the, each one of you is the first person to be on the top of K2 in winter. Right, mm, right. And then altogether, Nepal is the first country to be on top. <laughs> right, right. Uh, that's that's, that's so, the one of the best thing. So the Nepali climbers line up, 10 abreast and begin marching to the top together. And as they climb to the summit of the planet's second highest peak in the sub-freezing winter air, they all sing the Nepali national anthem. I, I, still, I still cannot express these things in my words. Our heart, it was like full of emotions. Our eyes, we, we had like kind of like, we are, our, our eyes were watery. Like we had the tears in the eyes. We caught up with Nims right after the climb too when he was celebrating with the team in Kathmandu. 
Can you talk a little bit about what the reaction has been um, in Nepal? All my team members feel like they're a rocky star, and it's so good yeah. to see in a big smile on my team. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a such a huge inspiration to the future generation uh, of, of Nepal as well. Most importantly for both Nims and Mingma Ji, was that the eight men that they recruited to help them make history all made it back safely to their families. I was very happy that I lead a team and everyone in the team, they came safe. Nothing happened between the team members. Nobody lose nothing. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is the most memorable thing for me that in, a, in such an extreme weather, I, I, I brought the team, team all safely back, back to home. There are people who will hear the story and think, that's crazy. I mean, why would anyone risk their life for just being able to say, you got to the top of a mountain in winter? But there will also be people who hear the story, including Nepali children, and think, if Mingma Ji and Nims can climb K2 in winter, what can I do? If you like what you hear and you want to support more content like this, please rate and review us in your podcast app. And please consider a National Geographic subscription. That's the best way to support Overheard. Go to natgeo.com slash explore to subscribe. Want to actually see that moment when Nepali climbers summit K2 singing their national anthem? Luckily for us, they took a video. Check it out on NIMS Instagram account, at NIMSDI. Of course, there's a whole lot more to this dramatic K2 expedition. And if you want to learn more, check out our magazine story, which includes a detailed map of the mountain. It's in the February issue of National Geographic. Plus, NIMS has got a new memoir out about climbing the 14 highest peaks in the world in record time. It's called Beyond Possible. I've read it and I couldn't put it down. Also, if you're wondering about the Polish climbers who started this winter climbing craze, check out Bernadette McDonald's book, Freedom Climbers. It's a fascinating read. That's all in the show notes. They're right there in your podcast app. This week's Overheard episode is produced by Alana Strauss. Our producers are Kari Douglas and Marcy Thompson. Our senior producers are Brian Gutierrez and Jacob Pinter. Eli Chen is our senior editor. Carla Wills is our manager of audio. Our executive producer of audio is Devar Ardalan. Our fact checkers are Robin Palmer and Julie Beer. Hansdale Sue composed our theme music and also sound designed and engineered this episode. This podcast is a production of National Geographic Partners. Whitney Johnson is the Director of Visuals and Immersive Experiences. David Brindley is National Geographic's Interim Editor-in-Chief. And I'm your host, Peter Gwynn. Thanks for listening, and see you all next time.